Hi everyone, my name is Ziv and I, yeah, sure. Okay, um, I hope you can hear me in uh, Zoom. Uh, so my name is Ziv, I am um, not an academic, I, I finished a master degree in physics, which is not really related to the topic of this uh, lecture or workshop, uh, but I am an activist in the areas of uh, climate change and animal rights. And in the last few years, I've been really thinking hard about how to actually make a change and how to make a successful resistance. And then in the last year, everything that happened in the country happened and everything I learned was just full on happening in real life. So it's pretty exciting to see it actually happening. And, and I want to share the things hmm? to tell. Okay, and I want to share the things that uh, I learned uh, in the last year and actually we are part of a team to trying to build a strategy and a movement for uh, climate change in regarding climate change in Israel and uh, yes we learned a lot and we are ready to launch in a few months and I think I hope it's fun that you find the things that we are talking about uh, relevant even if it's not regarding climate change. Um, yeah, so who are we? We are a part of a global movement called Extension Rebellion, uh, which is a movement that launched in 2018 in uh, England, uh, which regarding climate change is regarding the fact that the government of the world uh, did not succeed to actually combat climate change and the biggest threat to humanity, according to uh, Antonio Guterres, the Secretary General of the UN. Um, and after years of around the world of protests, of nice protests, trying to actually make a change and that you see that there is an inadequate action from governments around the world, they think that something needs to be done in which more serious. And in 2018, uh, the first rebellion, the, the Extension Rebellion launched the first rebellion in London. Uh, which they blocked main streets in London in, and they demand to tell the truth and act now and beyond politics, which is act not according to politics, but according to the, our actual best interest. Uh, and since then, they, since 2018, they're doing a twice a year uh, week of rebellion, which is a long time, 2018 to now almost six years of uh, action, of, of participate uh, function. And, and it actually made a difference. Uh, so you can see that uh, the UK was the first country to declare a climate emergency. London was the first city after the first uh, rebellion. Uh, a year later, UK parliament declared climate uh, emergency and follow suit after the UK, there was actually 36 countries. I think it's not updated, but there is more now that declared climate emergency and really took climate action into a priority. So you can see it actually um, made a difference. And so Extinction Rebellion is not something like we're not talking about civil resistance and nonviolence in the last uh, couple of days. And it's not something that we invented. It's actually, we like to think of it about, uh, to think of this as a tradition. We rely on a tradition of civil resistance. It has many years and I think that the, the like the founders of the modern civil uh, resistance was uh, Gandhi in the protests uh, against the occupation of the uh, British people in India. And another big uh, figure in this uh, tradition is Martin Luther King. Um, and there was actually a choice to make that the protest that we are doing is non-violent. Compared to a violent uh, protest, and the reason is that we believe that violence again are more effective than non-violent one than violent one. And I think this is already became a cliche. The 3.5 percent, like everybody heard about it. So there's actually a study by Erika Chenoweth you can see here, uh, which uh, collected over 600 uh, resistance around in the around the world in the recent history, and you actually see that nonviolent movements worldwide were twice as likely to succeed as violent ones. 
and no campaign, no campaign failed once they achieved the active and sustained participation of just 3.5% of the population. And a lot of them succeeded with far less than that. So we believe that the reason to choose nonviolence is not necessarily because we like only because of principles and because we, we think that it's the right thing to do, but it's actually more effective than other ways of uh, doing. And okay, but I think this is alone not really convincing. Why? Because that's just correlation. Correlation doesn't mean uh, causation. And also, I don't know from that, like there's a lot of, I can do a lot of things that are nonviolent. What the things that make certain actions or certain movements or certain uh, protests succeed more than others? Like what is the actual mechanism behind what makes a protest successful? And I ask the question because I really want to make a protest successful. I think like if we got climate change, I think in Israel, it's a non-issue, nobody, it's not a political issue, it's not an issue, nobody talk about climate change. And if we really want to make a change, we want to understand what is the mechanism that allows certain protests to succeed more than others, beside the fact that they are not violent. So luckily, we are not the first people who think about this. And there was actually a really big figure called uh, Gene Sharp, which was a political scientist. He died a few years ago. Uh, ah. okay. Oops. Yeah, sorry. So uh, uh, Gene Sharp, yeah, uh, he was a pacifist and he started to uh, study nonviolent uh, protest because of a principle, but then he began to question, okay, but what makes certain protests succeed more than others? And he came with uh, like a theory of power in society. So if I want to create change in society, if I want to, let's say, push for uh, uh, against racism or uh, um, same-sex marriage or climate change or against a dictatorship, like there's a lot of struggles that we can think about. So the first question, if I want to create change regarding a specific topic, is I need to ask who has the power, who holds the power to create that change? World, and in general, world's power in society. So Gene Sharp divided to two uh, different views of power. The first one is what he called the monolithic power. Power is held by elites, politicians, tycoons, CEOs. So if we think about this pyramid, the people at the top of the pyramid. And we actually have been educated to think that. Every time we study history, we study about how this leader launched this war against this other leader or this king. And if we talk about peace agreements, so there's this great politician who signed this peace agreement with another politician. And when we see like the news, they also talk about, yeah, so this politician now talked about this and he voted like this. And all our focus and attention most of the time is directed forward at the people at the top of the pyramids. Uh, Taken CEO, politicians, multimillionaires, people that like generally hold a lot of power. But Gene Sharp thinks that this power is that this view of power is not complete in itself. Why? Because let's say I am a king and I have a kingdom, and I tell my uh, citizens to do to go for a while or to do a specific thing. That in order for my uh, uh, order to be executed, I need the corporations of a lot of individuals to actually take this order into action. If I am doing it on myself, like I have no power on my own. The power in society is come for cooperation of the uh, public. The public needs to uh, have a lot of cooperation, a lot of obedience, a lot of uh, uh, a lot of um, participation in order for and a certain order to actually be executed. So Gene Sharp points about the fact that we generally don't think about that there is a social view of power. Power is ordered by the public support and by the public opinions. 
Uh, this is, I think, a really a great quote for him that summarizes it. Obedience is the art of political power. Rulers and other command system, despite appearances, are dependent on the population's goodwill, decisions, and support. Um, another quote that I really like is from a movement called the uh, Utpur, which was a movement in uh, Serbia. Uh, pretty sure like a lot of people are familiar that, with this movement in recent uh, time. So uh, the, this is an, uh, a quote from one of the activists in the movement. Even a dictator can collect taxes on, taxes on his own. He can deliver the mail, he can't even milk a cow. Someone has to obey the orders or the world things shut down. The task is to convince them to disobey. Then when they switch sides, the government starts to fail. And also this, uh, you can see this uh, image that really represents like how the people actually are responsible for the power that the people on top holds. Um, yeah, so this is the first principle. If we want to, uh, want to do a successful protest, we need to realize, firstly, power is in the hands of people. Um, but this view was, I think, is incomplete on its own. And there was actually a lot of criticism for Gene Sharp when he proposed these ideas. Because let's say I'm an individual and I decide that I don't want to cooperate with the system. I like Because I don't agree with the government, don't do uh, acts enough on climate change, and I don't pay taxes then I'll probably be in jail or they'll uh, I'll have some consequences. And if I am on my own, on my own, don't, uh, or I maybe mean, even a lot of people on their own just start to disobey, it won't actually make a change. So it's naive to say only that power is held by the public, but there is more nuance to that. So power is not only owned by the public, owned by the public, it um, spreads through what uh, Jim Sharp called pillars. So the public actually builds a lot of institutions and uh, constituencies and parts of society, which are themselves like pillars holding the status quo. So we can think of a bank and government and businesses and education and police and the army and services and uh, different sections of the public. So there need to be a lot of cooperation for a lot of different institutions in order for the status quo to be uh, maintained. So every ruler, every cooperation, cooperation, every government, every system of oppression depends on the cooperation of peoples, and not only people, but also institutes, which are composed in themselves of peoples. Um, so the theory is if we actually make the pillar collapse if we pillars withdraw the support from the status quo from the people that on top then we can actually uh, create the change and they don't have enough power to actually hold and continue to do what they are wanting to do and uh, this is a really nice theory i learned about it uh, a few years ago and i thought that this is really nice and uh, i think the last month in israel like really was <laughs> high speed, uh, like one-on-one, -on -one, how this is looking reality when pillars withdraw, pillar collapse, when pillar withdraw their support from the status quo. And you can see uh, economists uh, warning on judicial reform, high tech leaders in Israel resigned to resist the, the judicial overall. Um, vets, a lot of military people are withdrawing from volunteering in the army. Um, medical association, university, like here. Um, so there is like tons of examples of pillars in the pillars of support in the uh, uh, society that withdraw their support from the status quo. And actually that really make a difference. You can see like Aista Drut was a really great pillar in the last uh, uh, wave of protests that really make a, a lot of difference. And I think also like the pilots are a really good pillar, pillar that Without the cooperation of pilots, there is no way for the government to collapse, to, to continue. Um, yeah, so how does it look when an entire uh, pillar collapse? That doesn't really necessarily that we are looking at or we are like hoping for, but this is one example of how it can look like in reality. So uh, we talked about Utpur in Serbia, which was a uh, uh, Utpur was a movement that uh, ran through the 90s for over a decade, try to 
overall uh, Milosevic, which was a dictatorship in uh, Serbia. And it ends in October 2000 when he lost the elections and uh, refused to withdraw his power from, uh, uh, from parliament. They actually arranged tens of thousands of people to, uh, to protest at the capital and they, and they were, were freeing, free, sorry, they were fearing that uh, like the army and the police would start shoot people and, and kill a lot of people. But in reality, what happened is that the police and the army just joined the protesters and they couldn't, there were so many protesters that they could, could not uh, actually prevent them from coming out. And, uh, and they, you can see the smoke here that they burned the, the building of the parliament and actually they in power like make uh, Milosevic to be outside of power. Um, yeah, it doesn't be necessarily what we are looking at. We are, we are looking for, for what we want to, to see in, in, in our country, but this is a possibility. So um, if I am doing a protest and I want to create change, I want to launch a movement. I think to, I, I need to really think who is my audience? Who am I trying to convince? And I think Jim Sharp's contribution was that he identified that the, the audience of movements are not the people on top. They are the public. I want my goal as a movement is to shift the public discourse, to shift public opinion, to move people to support the movement and withdraw their cooperation from the status quo. And by that, to, to convince more and more people to, to withdraw their support. And even if uh, the, the people at the top of the pyramid doesn't change their mind, eventually they don't have the power to do that if the public are not agreeing with them. So I, I, I gave this lecture to a lot of uh, different audiences and a lot of people. And I think it was my initial intuition that actually when doing a protest, I want to change the opinions of the people on top. But there is a really big switch here that no, actually, the reason that we are doing a protest, the reason that we are blocking the roads, the reason that we are doing all the stuff is not for the people at the top, is for the public, is to, is to face the public and change their minds. And one thing I'll say, this is a workshop and not a lecture. So feel free to interrupt me and every time if you have a question or you want to add something. And there is we're soon going to a section that I actually ask an open question and I would like your participation. Okay, so how do we know if we are succeeding or not? Uh, another, uh, I think, really contribution of Gene Sharp was the concept of spectrum of support. So it's pretty easy concept, it's not very really sophisticated, but a lot of time when we think about certain issue in society, we're thinking about are people pro or against it? Are people pro or against the judicial reform? Are people pro or against uh, gay marriage? Are people pro and against uh, immigrators? Uh, and we can have a more nuanced view of public opinions. So instead of just thinking about pro and against, we can think that there is a spectrum of support in a certain issue. So I can think that uh, on one end, I have a uh, the movement, the people who are activists who are trying to push for a certain issue. Uh, and I have people who are active supporters, let's say like if we're talking about the judicial reform or people who are actually going to the streets and protesting and talking about with their families. Uh, and there is a lot of people who are not going through the streets, but they are still support the movement. So I call them passive supporters. On the other end, I can think about the opposition, the people who are actually protesting against us or really supporting the judicial reform and really active about this. And there are a lot of people who are supporting the judicial reform, but they are passive. They don't do anything with that. Uh, and in the middle, there is a lot of people who are neutral, of people who just doesn't care, didn't develop their opinion, didn't, don't think about this, or they just think they're, they're, it's complicated and there is uh, uh, right things from both sides. So, if I want to create a successful action, I, I need to, to plan an action, I need to plan a protest, I need to plan a movement that faces all of this spectrum. And what I want to do is to move people more to my side, to be, I want passive supporter to become active and I want neutral to actually take a stand on an issue. So how do I do it? 
My goal is if I talk to, uh, if I come back to uh, Erika Chenoweth uh, uh, research, I want 3.5% of active support. I want to increase the number of people who are actually active uh, as the research. So this is not an exact science. I think this is a lot of people are mistaken about it. But the goal is 3.5%. It's, it's a rule of time. I want a 3.5%. It's a really good thing if I can actually achieve that. And I think that in certain moments, this protest actually achieved more than 3.5% of the population. And, but in general, in addition to just 3.5% active participation, I want the majority of the public to be on my side. I want to shift the public narrative that most of the people are agreeing with me. And so how do we do that? How do we create this change in society? And that's uh, what we call about uh, polarization. So uh, we talk a lot about polarization uh, in the context of social polarization, like there is uh, uh, Ashkenazi people versus, uh, I don't know the word, Mizrahim neged Ashkenazim, like different sections of the public. Uh, ultra-orthodox versus the liberals. And when I talk about polarization, I try to avoid this kind of polarization. What I want to do is to polarize regarding an issue and not regarding uh, sects of the population. So let's take an issue like uh, climate change. And most of the people in the public are pretty neutral about it. They didn't think about this, or they just saw a movie and they think it's a bad thing, but they didn't really do anything about it. So when I do a direct action, when, and this is an example of Extinction Rebellion, they're blocking the parliament in the United Kingdom and demand climate justice. So if I see this kind of an action that they actually block the entrance to the parliament, I need to think to myself, I, I can't stay... Um, neutral. I can still stay uh, apathic to this. I need to actually take a stand. It's like force me to take a stand. This is crazy. What are the people are doing? They're blocking the entrance to the parliament. And then I need to, to formulate, I, it's make me to formulate an opinion. Is this justified? Am I against these people or I am for these people? What they are doing is, is, is that it makes sense or not? So what I'm doing is when I'm uh, making people to, to I'm, I want to force people to, to take a stand. And the goal is to design the actions and to design protests and design my messaging so more people go to my side than to the opposition side. But it's, I know that in this kind of process of polarization, more people will oppose me. I will create a backlash. And that's okay. And we can see that movement that don't create a backlash, they just the movement that nobody is heard about them. So that's why they don't have a backlash. And every time a movement is successful, there is uh, examples of an opposition are trying to oppose this movement. Uh, so Martin Luther King, which is one of our uh, main figures in this tradition, he actually understands it pretty well. Uh, Nonviolent direct action seek to create such a crisis and foster such attention, attention that a community which has constantly refused to, to negotiate is forced to confront the issue. It seeks to dramat dramatize in the issue that it can no longer, longer be ignored. So that is my goal as a civil resistance, as a movement to try to make a change in the public perception. I want to create drama. I want to create something that cannot be ignored and we force people to take an action. And you can see this, I think Ralph is amazing. You can see uh, over like decades, they ask people about what do you think is the most urgent issue in uh, the United States right now? And this is the percentage of people who think about that the most urgent people is racism or race related issues. And you can see that most of the time, not a lot of people really think about this, but every time there was a pick, it was a, a near an action or a protest or a wave of protest that the civil resistance movement in the United States had done. So actually, you can see this uh, photos. This is from the Birmingham campaign, which uh, there was a huge wave of protest where there was a lot of violence that directed forward the protesters. And when this picture of violence and injustice just uh, 
showed all over the media and the news in the United States that make a people to think, look about this. I'll come to that. So I hope you can hear me, but talk about this jump from here to here. And um, so it's become an issue that nobody talked about a few months ago, and then everybody's talking about it just in like a really uh, peak moment. And which is actually tell us that shift in public perception are not something that is gradual. It's actually, it's non-linear. There is jumps in public perception about regarding certain issues, what we call a, a moment of the whirlwind. And a year after this, the Birmingham campaign, there was actually the civil, uh, there was actually the first legislation that in law, uh, the, the Civil Rights Act that, that uh, actually addresses uh, systematic racism in the United States. So I have three goals. Energy is the base. I want to get to increase the size of the movement. I want to invite more and more people to join me. I want to win the, win the middle. I want to have a story and narrative and uh, actions uh, every time I want to, to face the uh, middle and I want to convince them to join my side and not the other side. And I want to isolate the opposition. I don't want to convince the opposition that they are wrong and I am right and invite them to join me. I am trying to make the opposition irrelevant. I want to, to frame them as crazy people. As, as they're like, it's crazy to just take a stand of the opposition. They like, actually want us to make in a dictatorship. They want us to uh, be at uh, the extent of climate change. They want to um, torture people and animals. I want to create this framing that nobody wants to be part of the opposition. So they are late, uh, left isolated, they're left alone in, this, in their stand. Okay, um, if someone wants to ask a question or to regard something I say, yes. Uh, excellent questions. Uh, so firstly, I think that if we analyze by what I just, the criteria I just mentioned, the protests in Israel, we are doing everything right. So I am more relaxed than my friend when I look about the, what's going on in Israel. I think it's a matter of time. The, the only thing we need to do is to keep escalating and keep uh, what we are doing, just not letting die out. And I think it's impossible for the government to, to cause, cause what happened inventionally is that they can control without an army and without a police and without, uh, like there's a lot of institutions that say that there's gonna be a conflict between the Supreme Court and the government, they're going to listen to the Supreme Court. So they just, they won't have power in the end if they just continue to do what they're doing. So I'm pretty like individually, I, I not too stressed about, about because I think the government, the protests now are doing everything right. And, and, and I'm still cautious because I can be wrong and it's also not an exact science. It's just a uh, um, rule of thumbs about what makes more protests succeed than others. Um, yeah, so, so we need to, to stay alert and to keep winning more and more percent of the population and to, to realize that we are not uh, losing part of our base or people, because you can say that if you talk about the uh, polls about the uh, judicial reform, it's not, they're not staying the, the same. They're like people shifting their minds 
for the month. And so we need to actually take a serious, take the poll seriously. We need our main objective is to convince the majority of the public that we are the right side. And the last questions with demonstration, I'll just it's the next the, the next part of my uh, talk is going to be about exactly what are the principles that make some certain demonstration better than others and how to um, how to plan a demonstration or to to like analyze a demonstration. Yeah. One of the principles is where you can see the Mm -hmm. Yeah. The question is whether we can target those. Mm -hmm. If we can insert, for example, to Chinese fortune some nude pictures. <laughs> Yeah, so so there is it's a really good question. And so I firstly I'm gonna say that it's it I think it's we're not in a very different situation than a lot of other uh, conflicts. Like if you think about Serbia and a lot of other uh, dictatorships, like the media was controlled by the government and there was a and now we have channel 14, but we have three other channels that are pretty on our side, pretty much on our side. So so we're in a better position than a lot of other fights or successful successful fights in other dictatorship that actually was successful in the end and a lot of um, what successful movement does is to create their own media to create their own channels of uh, messaging to the public and actually reach more and more people through their own messaging uh, and I think we are doing it pretty good like there's a lot of like we know how to do it. We we can target the public. Yeah, 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 yeah. But but that's that's important to energize the base. That's important that the base will stay like relevant and active for a long period of time. Uh, and regarding um, targeting channel thirteen, I I gotta say that it's something that we thought about doing an action in channel thirteen. In the end, we didn't do that. But it's a possibility. It's a, I don't know if exactly what you offered is the, it's the right thing, but uh, but it's a possibility. I am not ruling that out. You know, but um, the Syrian uh, <laughs> so um, something like that, you know, because we, we think of in Israel, there's a certain part of the population that um, is not exposed mm -hmm. to critical views on certain parts of, of society. So if we would if we would do a campaign of, you know, uh, for example, putting up a little, uh, you know, sticker in uh, in neighborhoods where uh, where shas is uh, and said, oh, let's be like a bad or sick and not like dairy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Or something like that. that mm -hmm. would be a way of counter, you know, getting around the, the, the very focused media that mm -hmm. everybody um, you, you know was exposed to. Yes. So you would very well be right. Yeah. These things have been done. Yeah, so that's a very interesting idea. Uh, I think that we should keep more of our energy in trying to convince the middle. I think people who voted to are like really in the position but i'm not sure like i think there is also in the own base a lot of uh, like doubt and and i like read this morning that there's a ted neman one of the uh in media of the uh, hasidic uh, 
part is actually raise the question, should we actually continue to do the digital refund in every price, no matter what? And, and I think there is also like cracks on their side. Uh, but I think the most effective thing to do is to actually target the middle, the people who are like, let's say there's a lot of people who voted to Likud and Netanyahu, and then in the recent polls, you can see that they shift sides. I think this is the people we can actually think as the middle and what kind of messaging and what kind of actions can convince them. So yeah, there will be a certain amount of population who will watch Channel 14 and no matter what, they'll just believe it as blind faith. But I think like if we talk about polarization and, and moving people to our side, the middle is much more um, productive. Uh, we, we want most of the population to be on our side and we want most of the institution and pillars to be on our side. And um, yeah, so let's go on the easy one first instead of the other ones. Uh, okay, so I want to move about, talk about how do we actually move the dial? How do we plan and successful actions? Um, so I think there's a lot to talk about how to plan a successful actions, and you can like extend about four hours. I'll just give four uh, points that I think are really, really, really important. Uh, Nonviolent disruptions, sacrifice, and framing. So the first one, which is the topic of everything we'll uh, discuss here, is nonviolence. Uh, violence creates negative public opinion and alienates potential supporters. If we doing a uh, violent action, if you uh, look about Channel 14, most of what they are saying, violent protests all around the country, they're like trying to provoke, they're trying to present us as violent. And that is like, it's really, really important to stay in a, uh, like in a very deep practice of nonviolence, because we know that once we turn violent, the, uh, the opposition have a lot of cards against us. There's a lot of justification to, to suppress the movement and a lot of people don't want to be like associated with a violent movement. So uh, you can tell, talk a lot about uh, nonviolence in like, uh, regarding values and regarding uh, spirituality and regarding, I think Gandhi and Martin Luther King talk about the nonviolence practice with a deep sense of a spiritual commitment for this. But even if you want to keep that aside, from a strategic point of view, most of the time, violence will just arm the fight. And, and we want to create a protest that everybody can join, grandmothers and aunts and children. And we want to be as massive as we can. We want, we have the power in numbers. So we want to create this kind of movement, a kind of protest that most of the population can join us. And the other thing is that the state has a monopoly on violence. If we are trying, if we are going violent, then we are competing them in the game that they are best at. Like they give a lot of, they have a lot of training of how to ride horses and shoot guns and, and, spray uh, with uh, pepper spray and we can't win with, if we're going to do that we we can win if we are going for the numbers and we can see over and over again i was actually in the night that uh, bb fired gallant uh, i went to i live in jerusalem and i went to gaza street uh, to protest and there was actually a, a machtuzit i forgot how to say it in english uh, Water, yeah, water cannon, we tried to spray the, the protesters and it didn't help because there were so many people and they were so determined. So we just, after some time, just went away and we just keep, so they can't, if we are organized and if we are a lot of people and if the masses are with us, they don't have enough power on us. They can't suppress it. And the other element which is important is disruption. So disruption is, capturing the attention of the public and communicate the urgency of our fight. If I am doing a disturbance, a disruption to the, uh, uh, I'm doing a disruption uh, to the like everyday life, it's something that people can't ignore. It's something that the media will cover. It's something that uh, people will talk about. It's something that they have to, like I said, everything. It's, it's forced people to make a stance. So I gave you a few examples of uh, famous disturbances. So. One is the uh, lunch counter sittings that the uh, black people in the civil rights movement did, which they came for a restaurant that they were not supposed, they were not allowed to be in there and just sit there and wait for 
the police to come and evict them. And then another group of people will just sit in and do it again, over and over and over again. And it's actually got a huge media attention. Uh, another thing is you can see two actions of Extinction Rebellion in London. One is they're blocking the uh, media, that they are because the media is sponsored by fossil fuel companies and they're not actually talking about the issue because they're getting money. So they want to raise awareness for it and it's actually got a lot of cover. And another really cool thing is that they're doing uh, some demonstration regarding this huge uh, octopus and then the police <laughs> took this octopus and went with the octopus on the street is something that you can't really ignore. So disruption is capture the attention of the public. And another really important thing is sacrifice. We as human beings have a natural tendency for empathy and sympathy. And when we see someone that is, that is suffering, we have the tendency to be on the side of the people who are hurt or the people who are suffering. So Gene Sharp called it political jiu-jitsu, turning the, repre the repression into weakness for those in power. So if I see a picture of someone getting uh, a violence from somebody that is hurting, I, I, what jiu-jitsu is like an act of uh, a martial art that people that are forcing the, the force that they, um, the, the enemy is giving on me and I turn it against them. So political jiu-jitsu is like the same way that I'm taking if someone is, if a police officer is beating me or uh, uh, doing, and I'm experiencing a lot of sacrifice and suffering, then the people from the side, the public that is showing the situation, that is watching the situation, is probably, I'm gonna get power from the public who watches it from the side and uh, turn in favor of my cause. So in a lot of uh, cases, we can see that our sacrifices actually launches the movement. And I think for us in story, history, uh, the, there is a, like, a really good example for this is George Floyd, uh, which in the beginning of uh, 2020 was uh, murdered by a police officer in the United States. And just this act when it was captured by uh, someone who, who captured it on his phone, it sparks a huge wave of protest all around the uh, uh, the United States of Black Lives Matter. So that's the act of sacrifice, the act of violence is turning the power of the opposition against it. And uh, the fall thing I want to talk about is framing. So I also could talk about this for hours, but framing is everything and every cause, every fight, every protest, every story that we tell, there is a way of looking. It's never, there is no an objective way to tell the story. So, and there is no objective way to just show the facts. There is always gonna be some framing and we can take the same issue and present it with very different framing that can capture public attention, uh, change public opinion, or I can do it in a way that alienates most of the public. So you can see uh, two protests talking about police brutality. One says, fuck the police, and the other one says, Black Lives Matter. And you can see, you can think about which kind of messaging actually is facing the public more and gaining public support, and which kind of messaging is actually alienating the public. Both of them talking about the same issue of police brutality. So uh, this is four factors. Nonviolence, sacrifice, disruption, and framing. And the goal is to create what we call positive polarization. We want to create such an action that people will have to take a stance and most likely will move to our side. And now I want to uh, show you a bunch of uh, recent events uh, from the, this current protest and maybe from other protests and ask you, how do you think this specific demonstration, this specific action affected the public perception? Do you think it's move more people to our side or it alienates more people? So uh, the first thing I want to say is uh, to, to show is the case of uh, Sarah Netanyahu that was uh, uh, trapped in, uh, in El Salon. It was uh, a few months ago and it's got uh, you can see this heroic picture of uh, Bibi old Sarah, and uh, there was an interview of Sarah in uh, Channel 14. How do you think this affected uh, Chan, the, the protest in the public side? Negative. 
Why? Yeah, so I think like there's a lot of people who didn't see what the problem with it. And there was also, like, I don't have, a, I, I don't think that I know the right answer for which of the cases I want to create a discussion. Uh, but I generally think that this was uh, and create a really negative view from the certain part of the public about the demonstration about the protest. Uh, and they really, and I also pretty sure that they planned this in order to make us look bad. Mm. Yeah, exactly. I heard that, I heard about it. If it was clear from the images that nobody is violent, if there was no shouting, if it was just like some kind of demonstration that everybody is burned down or something like this, then it was clear that the case that Sarah made that she, she was attacked is, is like complete bullshit. But uh, yeah, there, there was, it wasn't planned, like nobody planned it for happening. You just went in the middle of their protest in the air salon, in the middle of Tel Aviv. So of course they planned to that to, they wanted to create pub negative public opinion about that. Yeah, so the public is like all of the public and we can think about all of the spectrum of support. And I want like, let's think about the entire spectrum of people who are really on the side of the protest and people who are really against the protest and the people in the middle. So every action is moving the dial a little bit. So the question is, how does it move? So the people who are like active supporters, the people who are part of the demonstration and the protest, they really didn't really change their mind. But if you think about something who doesn't really formulate in you know, people and they, they see this action about and they hear the interview of Sarah in Channel 14, they might go to the negative side about the process. They might think that the process is unjustified. Yeah, how does it uh, shift the dial exactly? Uh, another uh, question. How do you think these incidents of police using water cannons and uh, the recent events of uh, injured uh, um, military persons how do you think this affects public perception? What does it mean? For us. For us. Any different, uh, you want to elaborate? Once you present uh, one side of the objection, it's more uh, Exactly, yeah. So I think it's a, like every time I see uh, violence in, in the protest and picture of people else from the protest, like I, it's terrible for the people. I feel sorry for the people, but I think this is excellent for the protest. This is actually is fueling uh, protesters to go out for the streets because people are actually, like you said, once there is a victim and once there is, you think that there is injustice, it's just exposed and injustice, people are just more energized to join the protest. Uh, and it's, I think it's winning public support. So I think um, in, uh, the, in a lot of protests of Martin Luther King, they actually went and um, make people go out of the street that they, that they were no, we're going to get hurt. And they did it because they wanted the picture of people suffering from police brutality to propagate for the entire United States. Um, another uh, photo, another uh, headline. Tel Aviv protest against judicial reform turned violent. Not good. <laughs> yeah, I think this this uh, photo is really, if you look about this photo, it's really hard to claim that the protest there, there are, is not violent. You can see that there is a, a, like anger in his face. He's trying to push the police. It's really make us as uh, violent. Uh, we are doing actually uh, trainings in uh, uh, NVDA, in nonviolent direct actions. And we like teach people how to confront officers. And when we want, we sometimes want to break like the, the blockade of the police, but we teach people to like all the ends up there. So it's clear that they are not uh, targeting anyone and they're not trying to hurt anyone or there or behind the reds, they are behind their backs. Uh, so we can teach people how to, stand inside the situation to make to to, to be clear that we are nonviolent. And this photo I think is is not showing that it's really clear that there was anger there. Uh, okay so this is happened uh, a week and a half ago. 
of uh, a few protesters trying to break into uh, the Knesset while they're discussing the Ilata Svirot. What do you think about that? Why? Mm -hmm. And it's also created a lot of public uh, debate about this. Like there was a lot of discussion about it. They did make disturbance that was not facing the public, just facing the, uh, the Knesset and the people in government. And they make a lot of fuss about it. Uh, so actually, the people who did it are my friends. They're part of the rebellion. And you can see that when they are, uh, they are evicting them, they're doing, they're just lying on the ground and just make them drag them. They're not uh, trying to resist. They're not trying anything. They just let them drag them away because that's also like a practice of nonviolence. And uh, yeah, I don't know in the grand scheme of things how most of the public uh, uh, think about this action, how this is a fact, but this is one possible action that you can do. Um, blockades. What do you think about blockades? Really? <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. Cool. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. And actually, you see the left behind the other flag? It's my left. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. So I chose the right photo. There are tons of photos of them. Okay, so I chose exactly the right one. What do you think about this kind of action? That doesn't necessarily specifically this blockade, but there was just tons of blockades recently. It's effective. Why? Mm -hmm. It creates a lot of disruption for sure. Like the people talk about it a lot. Uh, I think, I, I think, I, I think there is a debate that we should be having about the like, should we keep this? and how much we should keep this kind of actions. I think they're effective for sure, and it did create a public narrative. I don't know if I would, I think there is a debate if should we continue to do it all the time or move to different tactics? Because uh, people, are, so we can think about uh, disruption and sacrifice in two axes. You can do actions with a lot of disruptions, but not a lot of sacrifice, and the actions with a lot of sacrifice, but not a lot of disruptions. Uh, so this is a lot of disruption, but not very a lot of sacrifice. People are not really suffering from this kind of action. And, and uh, also there's a lot of people who really get annoyed from this. And you have the, the, uh, the, the ability to do more disruption as you have more public opinion behind you. Like if all of the public is really, really supporting you, then you have all the rights in the world to do it. But if you do disruptions when there is not enough public uh, uh, support for your cause, then you can actually create a backlash and you can have people that will be against the protest. So mm. yeah, cool. Yes. Mm -hmm. Everybody who's there felt that they've done something. Sure. And I, I also have friends who, and we have the right to short stuff. To have what? Short stuff because people don't die. Mm -hmm. and, 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so one thing that the opposition will try to do is to, I think Bibi also posted a, a I think a fake article that 
there were ambulances that were blocked by the blockades and people died because of it, which was not true. Mm. Yeah. To the, to the street, yeah. So yeah, I think I think everything is not. I, I don't have a clear answer for everything of this. I think there is a lot of debate to to go in about the effectiveness, but there is something that also has been shown in studies that a lot of time people are against a specific protest, against like the the means of the protest, they're against this type of tactic but they are uh, like supporting the protest. Like I support the protest, but not in this way. And actually, if they were not doing this kind of actions, they were not supporting the protest. Because the, the, you can say that in, uh, when Martin Luther King, there is a famous uh, letter like he wrote from jail. And he wrote the letter for his like, white friends who exactly said that, I support your cause, but I don't support the way you do it. And that, like, he writes them, if we were not doing a direct action, if we were not doing disturbances, then you weren't talking about it. Nobody's talking about it before we actually made the disturbances. So there is a lot of issues. So disturbances can affect a lot of the public and can create negative public opinion, but they also can make people talk about this and, and increase the urgency. So, so uh, we, we have a balance here. But like, and always need to, to ask ourselves, in this part of the protest, are we are doing the right balance? Um yeah, blockades in the in the train stations. What do you think about that? <laughs> what do you say? I think it's wood. It was interesting here, forty pounds arrested. Mm -hmm. That also shows people were ready to, mm -hmm. to sacrifice, yeah. Yeah, so if people are ready to sacrifice, that's really, to, to be arrested, that's a lot of sacrifice, I think. The number of arresting people are really showing the urgency of the situation. Yes. Yeah. Wow. And the parents were terrified. 
<laughs> sure, yeah. Yeah, it, 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 it's connected to what I said earlier, but framing is everything. It's like you cannot cover anything with like objectively. And uh, for sure, the media has a lot of uh, influence about how it's perceived, but I also can, when I plan an action, I need to really think about how the opposition will present this action. So, so that's so that it will be difficult for the opposition to, to present it as violent. Yes. They can do this, call them a terrorist organization, mm. because they are quite So. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Exactly. It's also on a matter of numbers. Uh, what do you want to say to me? Oh. Um, so obviously it's in the same area of type of uh, disturbances that faces the public um yeah, but, but maybe you can think about it. People who are traveling in the train are like more, usually more of uh, lower income families and it's affect different kind of population than people who have a private uh, car. So you can think about that. Uh, Actually, yeah, the trains continue, but, but I, I'm pretty sure there was a lot of people who missed those trains. <laughs> Which is not the worst thing in the world, yeah. So I missed the train a lot of times. <laughs> I never died from this. It was really a good symbolic mm -hmm. act. Cool. Yeah, that's a really. Good angle about it and it didn't find about it. So I don't have a lot of how much time do I have left? 50 minutes. Okay. <laughs> you have to go to the words. Okay, another action, different context. So this was an action from different uh what is it was I think almost 10 years ago. Uh, and it was regarding uh, animal rights. So there was activists in Israel who like burned on their uh, flashes numbers like they do into animals in the animal agricultures. What do you think about? <laughs> what? Mm. <laughs> Too much. It did capture the... Mm -hmm. But it can make it, people talk about it. So, so you have also negative publicity is still publicity, but you still you make people talk about an issue that nobody's talking before, but still maybe you move people to another side on this issue. So there is another thing I want to say from Extinction Rebellion. So this was an action that uh, in London, they tried to block a train, but it's not just like in Israel that they blocked the station, but actually people, someone climbed on the train and people trying to like drag him off the train. 
What do you think about that? <laughs> I know that uh, like a lot of people talk about this in uh, like in London about these kind of actions, and it also got a lot of negative publicity that you're actually targeting public transport, which is like I said before, more lower income uh, um, parts of the population are using this. And another cool actions by uh, a sister movement of extinction rebellion called Animal Rebellion to actually. Uh, occupy a meat market for an entire day and they sell instead of selling meat they're selling uh, fruits and vegetables for an entire day <laughs> that's nice <laughs> <laughs> uh, maybe i don't know but it's just i think the the symbol of uh, selling uh, Mm. Yeah. Yeah. So that reminds me that uh, in uh, Serbia, like when Utpo did actions, and there was a lot of like interface with the police because a lot of them did actions and the police arrested them. So they always uh, went with t-shirts of we love Serbia. And then the narrative that the opposition tried to tell their terrorists and they ate Serbia and they're like, it's regarded as uh, the enemy. It was harder to paint that kind of a picture when they just all the time went with t-shirts that we love Serbia. Yeah, 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 exactly. I think the flag is an amazing uh, addition to the... Uh, for this. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay, just few. I want to give a like, few examples of uh, successful actions from around the world that are actually make a positive uh, influence and make like change public perception about regarding like, certain issues. Not just actions, but movements and protests. Uh, so the first one I already talked about is the um, civil rights movement in the United States during the 50s and 60s, uh, which made a lot of difference in how uh, race-related issues, I think, viewed in the United States and around the world. And you can say that they actually make a lot of difference, uh, these kind of actions of all the parks refusing to take a seat. I don't know a lot of people know this, but actually this action of all the parks that you refuse to the stand was planned. This, this is an actual photographer, a professional photographer that come with her to the bus and take the picture. This kind of case happened a few months before with a different person, with a different uh, woman that refused to stand. But she was young and pregnant and just the movement didn't want to choose her out of the face of the protest. So they just ignored it. And then they like... Uh, planned these actions in the full distance before and they planned that the day after that they're going to do uh, a protest and start the uh, bus boycott and a lot of time when i study about this like in history lessons it was viewed as it was a spontaneous just yeah she just refused and then all the people talked about it but no they were actually there was a movement behind this who planned these actions and uh, um yeah, just framed everything in with its own mind. And another movement is uh, Occupy Wall Street, which is really uh, similar to the 2011 uh, um, like the yeah, and and a lot of people you can think if you look about this kind of protest that is like naive, and it was the 99% protest. Uh, a lot of people talk about like inequality and that how the um, wealth distribution in society is unfair. And then like the process launched was a few months of a lot of people talk about it, but then nobody talked about it. And it, it looked like it didn't make a lot of change in society. But actually, if you look, there is a study which uh, will check how much the word inequality appeared in newspapers before and after the protest. And you can see that 
it really changed the public discourse regarding inequality. And like, it was an issue that nobody, almost nobody talked about inequality. And then it was an issue that everybody's talking about. There was a lot of small uh, union fights that were won because the public discourse has shifted around this uh, topic. Uh, and I think until this day, like th there was a change in society, I would view this topic of inequality. The movement hasn't won, obviously, but it did create a really influence, lasting influence. Some people would say. And this is Sunrise Movement in the United States. And they are also a climate uh, movement and they are pushing for a Green New Deal, which is a climate, really big climate legislation in the United States. You can see the, the Google term searches for Green New Deal, the day they did an actions in Nancy, Nancy Pelosi office, demanding her to support a Green New Deal for the United States. And you can see that there was, there was a lot of public discourses, even Trump talked about the Green New Deal, and uh, like there was a lot of debate that they actually made it happen. Well, the huge like part of making the, the discourse about Green New Deal. And this was, I think, around 2018. Last August, a year ago, the United States has passed the Inflation Reduction Act, which is the biggest climate legislation in the history that the United States ever passed. It's not a Green New Deal that they demanded, but I think you can argue that there is a lot of, uh, the science movement have a lot of influence about this uh, act actually passing. Um, and Extinction Rebellion, of course, uh, which is uh, my home. Uh, you can see the term, a climate crisis, like how much the term in climate emergency was used before and after. So you can see around 2006, people talk about it. I think it's around the Al Gore movement, the movie, uh, The Inconvenient Truth. And then people just didn't talk about climate change. And actually in 2018, after the first uh, action of uh, Extinction Rebellion, there was a huge spike of people talking about climate change and climate crisis. And, um, there was uh, more and more people in the United Kingdom that actually worrying about climate change and talking about it. So it actually changed the public discourse regarding these specific issues. And that's it. I think I've done. <laughs> what to do tonight? Go to protest. <laughs> but I, I think. I, Creative protest. I think it's uh, we need to uh, be focused more about sacrifice and less, of, less about disruptions. I think the movement is a lot of emphasis about disruptions and not a lot about the concept of sacrifice. Um, and also, I think there is a case. I I I just it's my opinion. I I'm not like I'm not know if I write, but I think we should focus more about actions that. Uh, less disturbance to the public and more disturbance to the politicians. And I think this kind of actions that were in the uh, Melia is, is a really nice uh, action because it's not really, you, you can't really uh, argue that it's affect anybody in a bad way. And, and it's really harder to make, a, like the opposition, it's harder for it to make a, a case that we are the bad guys. So I think we need to always keep in mind how is the other side can frame what we are doing and let's try to think about ways to create the kind of actions that it's going to be harder and harder for them to, to claim that we are uh, terrorists. Yeah, <laughs> but that's a good uh, exercise. It's really, really uh, important, I think, in my opinion. Thank you very much.